Let me introduce Peter from Cockroach DB. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about distributed tra transactions and how they work in Cockroach DB and some of the new additions we've made to our uh, distributed transaction protocol. To start off, though, how many of you know what a transaction is? So we're going to talk, I'm going to walk you through how Atomisty is implemented um, for distributed transactions, which is even a step above implementing for transactions. I want to do this call out to uh, this awesome webinar that Kyle Kingsbury did um, just this past summer, a couple weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago now, um, talking about uh, how distributed transactions are implemented in various distributed um, databases nowadays. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of great overview of the different mechanisms used, except there's this wonderful slide when he gets to talking about Cockroach DB, and he puts this up here, and he says, like, what? What's going on here? One phase commit? That's what the one PC stands for. He draws, uh, draws this awesome diagram that has arrows pointing every which way, and for those in the back, I hope you notice the, the yellow, or maybe that's orange arrows, showing, you know, stuff going every which way, and uh, kind of question marks about what's going on. Uh, the voiceover for this um, bit is kind of humorously awesome. Um, he says, uh, and then you're, you're done, I think. Then some sort of miracle occurs, <laughs> and he laughs. And then somehow this ends up providing serializability, which is you know, this guarantee of transactions that's pretty hard to achieve. So Cal Kingsbury, expert in distributed systems, was taking a look at how this worked, and he was uh, kind of confused. Um, but we're going to be talking about that miracle today. Um, and how it's implemented in Cockroach DB. I'm sorry if I'm turning back and forth, but my slides and whatnot aren't synchronized, so I want to make sure that you're looking at what I'm talking to. Anyway, uh, if you know anything about transactions, you've probably heard this term ACID. Um, stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. Um, this talk is mainly going to be about atomicity, and in some ways it kind of is like the, the, the foundational um, principle of transactions, uh, and in, in the sense that there, there's, you know, kind of contention over what consistency levels you might want to achieve and isolation levels, but atomicity is like it's uncontentious. Um, you have it, you don't, and transactions have to have it. <clears throat> so, uh, parallel commits, the, you know, kind of the, the subtitle of this uh, talk is this new uh, transaction protocol that we've implemented. Um, and actually, I would do a call out to uh, that fine gentleman over there from Cockroach DB, Nathan. Um, he was the, the primary implementer of this. And it took quite a bit of work to get here. Um, parallel commits, uh, sorry, going ahead. Uh, they're a, an atomic commit protocol. And I'm going to, what, what does it mean by an atomic commit protocol? In order to implement atomicity, you need to have some mechanisms in the system um, to make the transactions actions appear all at the same time. So let's see how Atomicity has worked in CockroachDB. And I'm going to talk about kind of historically how it has worked. Um, CockroachDB, we break all the data in the system up into ranges. Um, ranges are 64 megabytes in size. Each range is actually a raft consensus group. I'm going to kind of gloss over some of this, because this is kind of background knowledge. Um, but you need to have it to understand later on what's going on. Um, since each range is its own raft log, uh, the updates to each range are atomic, but we want distributed transactions that span ranges. In order to get atomicity for distributed transactions, we have to bootstrap it in some fashion. And that bootstrapping mechanism is the fact that writes to individual ranges due to raft are atomic. How do we uh, actually have that bootstrapping ha happen? Each transaction has a transaction record that's sto stored on a well-known range in the system. And there's essentially a switch inside the transaction record. And we flip that switch when we're committing the transaction, and we flip it from a, a, a pending state into a committed state. So I'm going to walk you through an example. What I said so far, you might be looking at me kind of dull-eyed, saying like, ah, I don't quite understand what this means. So I'm going to walk you through a full example of how this works. So what I'm showing here is I'm showing a four-node cockroach cluster. And on each of the nodes, we have you know, different colored um, ranges. We have a, a blue range that's on nodes one, two, and three, a yellow one that's on uh, nodes one, two, and four, and that red range that's on nodes one, three, and four. And ranges can you know, appear on any nodes inside a cluster. And then we're going to do a, a SQL transaction. We're going to insert, I hope that's not too much of an eye chart for people in the back, we're going to insert two rows into a table. And there's kind of like, you know, this is high-level depiction of what's happening. Um, there's actually quite a bit more details under the cover. When we do this insert, that gets sent to a gateway node. 
the gateway node starts processing uh, the, the insert statement. And the first thing it does is it sees that first key that's being inserted. Um, it sees that first key being inserted, Sunny, and it sends it on and sends it to the range containing Sunny. And that happened to be the red range here. And what you see, there's two things that happened here. We end up creating the transaction record. Um, it's almost always created on that range that has the first write in the transaction. Once the uh, transaction record uh, is received and the sunny key is received, we send it on to the followers of that, of that raft group. And those get sent on, one of them acknowledges the right, the leader acknowledges the right as well, and then we consider that that right is kind of in this kind of nice pending state for the transaction. I've highlighted sunny in yellow on those ranges because those rights aren't visible to other transactions at this point. What we did is we wrote down what we call a write intent. It's an intent by the transaction uh, to, to write that record. So then we move on and we get to Ozzy and we go to, to write Ozzy and there's the same kind of uh, mechanism takes place. We locate the, the leader range for Ozzy. We go there. It sends on the right to the followers. One of them acknowledges it. That gets acknowledged back to um, the gateway node. And I'm sorry, I clicked through a little bit too fast there because the very last step is when we do the commit. And the commit step is just going to flip that bit on the transaction record. And I'm just going to go back and forth here. You can see the transaction record there at the bottom. It gets committed. That gets sent on to the followers. And then we acknowledge it. And at this point, the transaction is complete. And something to, to point out here that's an interesting detail, we still have these write intents left around. At this point, any other transaction can come in and they could read the new Sunny records. And the way they, they do resolution is they'll say, oh, there's an intent here. Let me go see what the state of the transaction is. And they go to that, that, that transaction record, they see it's committed, and they're like, ah, okay, transaction's committed. I can read this record. All right. So if you're like to think, you know, coming in and you don't know anything about transactions and how to implement atomicity, uh, you might kind of think like, ah, implementing transactions is kind of a game of trying to do things simultaneously. I want to simultaneously make all these rights um, visible. But we don't li actually like to view it like that. We like to view um, atomicity as a game of visibility. How do I do one action and have that action cause a lot of things to happen all at the same time? And uh, various um, databases, they all have the same problem. And they all end up doing something centralized. And that's what you've seen so far in CockroachDB as I described it. We did the centralized operation with the transaction record commit bit. I like to visualize this as a light switch. And essentially, historically, this is what we had. We had a single bit, we flipped it, off it's uncommitted, on it's committed. So we've been evolving this protocol over time. What I just described was kind of like the original transaction protocol in CockroachDB. And uh, those paying attention were like, wow, that's a lot of round trips you were doing there. And we're like, yeah, that is a lot of round trips. Um, it was correct, it wasn't fast. So we've been doing improvements over time. About a year ago, we introduced this idea of transaction pipelining, which is we figured out how to pipeline all the right operations up until we do the commit. We have some um, constraints in our transaction protocol. And these constraints are imposed upon us by wanting to be kind of a normal SQL database. SQL is conversational. You can start a transaction. Uh, your application can then have logic, you know, performing reads, making decisions about what else it wants to do. And there's a back and forth. Um, that's a serious imposition on any transaction protocol. We want each mutation to start replicating right away. Uh, statements um, in transaction pipelining, the, we don't actually have to wait for the, the replication to finish, though. We can actually keep on moving on. And then at the very end of the transaction, when we go to commit, then we have to wait for everything that was happening um, at the same time uh, to finish. And only then can we flip the commit bit. So I'm going to walk through kind of a quick example. So this is the, the same example I did previously, but this is a different view of it. This is looking at kind of the timeline of operations, and the round trips involved. And what you see um, under the serial one is going to be like, this is the original protocol that we had, and then with the pipelining, pipeline protocol on the right. So you start doing the transaction, you write Sunny. In the serial version, we would write that uh, transaction record, wait for it to be written, do a consensus round trip, and then we'd write the Sunny record and wait for that. With transaction pipelining, we write both of those at the same time. You come on, and then you go to write Aussie. Serial, again, has to do the full consensus round trip and wait for it. But in pipelining, it can just fire that off um, right away. The earlier write probably hasn't even finished at this point. 
And then lastly, we, uh, we commit the transaction. And in serial, it's again, waiting for a consensus round trip there. But with pipeline, all we have to do, we can't start writing, um, committing the transaction until all the other ones have finished. So we do a wait there and then we commit it and you end up having only two consensus round trips to commit a transaction. And this is a pretty great improvement. We have this Delta T here. We actually see this in real world operation with transaction pipeline enabled that there's a significant latency benefit to structuring things this way. <clears throat> so um, if you took a database course in college, or even if you haven't, you might've heard of this uh, phrase called two-phase commit. And what, you know, the transaction pipelining protocol is a little bit like two-phase commit. You do this prepare stage where you send out the intents and wait for them to complete. And then when all that's done, you um, commit and you mark the transaction record as committed. Two latency round trips, pretty good. We were feeling pretty good about ourselves, um, but still two is too high. It's not like the theoretical minimum. That would be one. So this slide is to indicate this problem of how to do distributed transactions and commit them efficiently has actually received a lot of academic interest. We saw this kind of get um, you know, started when the Spanner paper came out. Um, there's systems like Tapir and Carousel. Um, FaunaDB has a mechanism to reduce the number of uh, round trips to commit a transaction. A lot of these had caveats that made them unsuitable for use in CockroachDB. You'd have to significantly change the client applications um, in order to use them. So our goal with parallel commits, commit a transaction with a single round trip of latency. And we have these requirements. You know, transactions can't commit until all the rights are replicated. We didn't want to give up our durability story. Uh, the commit state itself has to be replicated. Some of the academic work um, stopped replicating the commit state, but then you can get into a fragile state in your system, and that's not something that we found um, acceptable. Uh, the commit state must be reached atomically. You shouldn't be able to have a situation where it's unknown what the state of a transaction is. And also, very importantly, the transaction right set, it, ha it can't be known at the beginning of the transaction. That was too much of an imposition on developers. Um, general SQL, you don't know the right set at the beginning of the transaction. So <clears throat> previously, the transaction record had a single committed bit, and that was the, the commit state. And instead, with parallel commits, uh, we kind of distribute the commit state. And there's no longer a single bit, it's a distributed commit, commit condition. And I'm gonna walk through um, how this works in just a second. Um, what ends up happening is we send out all the writes and put the transaction record into a, a staging uh, mode, along with inside the transaction record, it lists out all the keys that were written in the transaction. And together those two things allow anybody who comes across a key that's part of the transaction to look up the transaction record and determine if all the other keys were written. So here's my visual depiction of what this looks like. Previously, there was a single light switch. Now we have 10. Well, it's as, as many light switches as you have records written in your, in your key along with the transaction record. And all of these have to be flipped um, to on for the transaction to be committed. So I'm gonna walk through what this looks like. And I'm still comparing versus serial. We could do this comparison versus transaction pipeline as well. So you begin in writing, and in the serial one, you write the transaction record in Sunny, yada, yada, yada. With parallel commits, you just send out the, the Sunny write. And we send out the Aussie write too. We haven't waited for anything at this point. And lastly, we write the transaction record uh, with parallel commits in this uh, staging uh, mode. And also importantly, that transaction record uh, lists Sunny and Aussie as the records that were written in the transaction. And then we just do this final wait for all these things to complete. And that's when the transaction is committed. Um, that, that delta T was significantly higher than when uh, with the transaction pipelining mechanism. <clears throat> and we actually see the benefit in practice. So what this graph is showing is uh, the, the effect of uh, transaction pipelining versus parallel commits. And previously, when we had transaction pipelining, as soon as you added a secondary index to a table, it would suddenly change all rights to that table, you know, even for a single key that were previously hitting you know, just a single range in the system, suddenly they were distributed transactions instead of single range transactions. And you'd see you add a secondary index and latency you know, increases quite a bit for those operations. And then it levels off because we're just doing these um, two round trips of latency. But with parallel commits, it just stays almost perfectly smooth. And that was, uh, that was our own little miracle inside Cockroach Labs when we actually uh, we saw this graph. All right. 
so fun stuff along the way to developing this is uh, we actually, while it was being developed, we happened to bring in um, a consultant who gave us a training session on TLA+. If you guys haven't heard of TLA+, it's a, a, a tool uh, for proving, you know, kind of uh, facts about a, a system. And it's a, a modeling language. You model your system, and then you can prove various things about it. So um, Nathan over here, he, he took this uh, course with the consultant and he decided to model this parallel commits protocol. And you know, there's this model checker there and was able to prove various things about it. And I, I wouldn't say that this is like a panacea, but it's like just this excellent tool to have in your toolbox. If any of you pay attention to uh, AWS, they're famously big proponents of doing this kind of formal checking. You know, you wanna do your stress testing, you wanna have like Jepson and Kyle Kingsbury kicking the crap out of your system. Um, but this is yet another thing you can do to uh, you know, uh, reassure yourself that you've caught all the problems. Um, this is just an example of some of what uh, the TLA Plus looks like. Um, I have to say, I think the big thing holding TLA, play, TLA Plus back is that the language is ugly as heck. It was done by Leslie Lamport. Um, he also did tech, uh, which is also, you know, frankly, ugly as, uh, as heck. Um, or he did latex tech, actually. Um, but it, the, this shows some of the, the, the definitions that we have for modeling parallel commits and also some of the properties um, such as, you know, an implicit commit leads to an explicit commit eventually. Um, there's no, uh, the, the model checker will actually check all the different uh, states in the system and verify that that property holds. All right. So, uh, parallel commits, um, they've been in CockroachDB since May. Um, they haven't been in a released version yet, but we're feeling really confident about them. Um, they're going to be enabled by default in version 19.2, and that's actually uh, coming out in... Uh, October. Um, there's a little thank you at the end here because I borrowed this from uh, th this presentation from someone else, from Nathan actually. So a call out to some of the uh, internal Cockroach TV developers that were involved in doing this development. All right, that is it. Thank you.